The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa uh, Existential Kink. Carolyn Elliott is here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to just hand it to the MC of today. And that's Alara Catone. Uh, and Laura's going to be having a, a series here at the Stoa, which we'll talk about at the end. But uh, yeah, I will take in uh, Laura right now. Welcome, everyone. So good to see you all. Some familiar faces and new faces. Um, it's a great turn on really to get to <laughs> and see this session with Carolyn Elliott. Um, it was kind of a surprise for me. And I've been steeping in her practice of existential kink. So excited to get to ask some questions. So th for those of you who are new to the STOA, the STOA is a place for us to cohere in dialogue around what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. This is being recorded. And um, as you have questions come up at any time, you can put them in the chat. And it's helpful if you write a cue next to it. Um, and we know you have a question and we'll bring in your questions in a bit. And you can also plus one questions along the way. And that way we know which questions to prioritize. This will be on YouTube. If you do not want to be on YouTube, I can ask your question for you. So just indicate that in the chat. I think I got all of it, right, Peter? <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest today, Carolyn Elliott. Carolyn uses applied occult philosophy, a cutting edge approach to Jungian psychology and hermetic principles to help people dramatically change their lives for the better. Carolyn is the author of Existential Kink, Unmask Your Shadow and Embrace Your Power, and also another book, a cult favorite um, around creativity and it's called Awaken Your Genius. So Carolyn, we welcome you to the STOA. And I'll start by asking if there's anything that you wanna to add to your introduction that I didn't say. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Laura, a lovely introduction. Um, well, just um, I have a PhD in critical and cultural studies from the University of Pittsburgh. So I've read a whole lot of continental philosophy and um, I do have some familiarity with the Greeks and, and the Stoics also. Um, I currently, my, I have a business where I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching and I also run a membership called Wealth where we help leaders come into their full power via their hermetic arts. So that's kind of what I do with myself. And I can tell you guys more about my coaching and about my teaching later on, but I'm so, so happy to be here to talk with you. Mm -hmm. So I think starting with what is the philosophy of existential kink or the process of existential kink for those that aren't familiar? Sure, sure. So um, the, uh, well, the process is a meditation where basically um, I invite myself and others to set aside a contained amount of time, like about 15 minutes a day, to practice going within and um, working with situations in our lives that usually we don't like. And often there's some form of scarcity, some kind of uh, perceived lack of money or love or creative inspiration or attention. And to practice feeling into those painful and difficult situation, um, painful and difficult sensations, and allowing ourselves to experience them as pleasure. Um, so widening the window of sensation that we are willing to experience as pleasure, because most of us are conditioned to experience only a very small little fragment of reality as pleasurable. So we practice opening up this window, and. Um, 
it can be done. <laughs> and there's a whole, so that's the essence of the practice. Um, so what can happen in the practice is we can find ourselves actually orgasmically, genitally getting off <laughs> in sort of a BDSM inspired kinky way on painful, challenging, usually repeating patterns in our lives. Like we don't seem to be able to make more than a certain amount of money each month, or we keep finding ourselves with the same sort of partner that reminds us of a, you know, yucky parental situation, or we're creatively blocked, or we're having a recurring challenge with our body. Um, all of these things are connected um, with what Freud liked to call repetition compulsion. So basically, things that um, may have happened to us in childhood or, or patterns that we've received from our parents that we somehow seem to be compulsively recreating in our lives, even though our conscious minds are like, oh my gosh, this sucks. I do not like this at all. But yet we find ourselves again and again um, seemingly limited by these patterns. So what we do when we give ourselves permission to actually get off on them in a humorous, gentle, loving, kinky way is we release the energy that's been trapped in those patterns. We take it from the unconscious and we make it conscious. So, you know, Carl Jung, the famous pioneering psychotherapist, uh, famously said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. And in my experience, that is immensely true. There were all sorts of things that I thought that I was just fated to experience over and over again. And what I didn't realize was I was taking an unconscious pleasure in those situations. Or I may have even known it at some level, but I still wasn't fully letting myself feel that pleasure. So existential kink is a very embodied somatic practice where what we do is we practice um, gently making space for ourselves to allow that unconscious pleasure that causes us to compulsively repeat and recreate negative situations to become conscious. So it's a deeply alchemical process. It's very connected um, to what, um, what's known in the Western tradition as the alchemical marriage the union of the conscious mind, the sort of um, ordinary ego self with the vast unconscious that of course includes all of our primal sort of animalistic urges. Um, and that also includes our golden, beautiful divine dimensions. And that also includes all sorts of things, uh, you know, envy, anger, grief that may not have been welcomed socially for us growing up that may have also gone into the unconscious. So, um, oh boy, there's so much to say about that. Is that a good little intro, Laura? Does that yeah. kind of make sense? Okay. Yeah, that's great. I'd love to draw you out a little bit on this, on the importance of pleasure. Why the focus on, on pleasure? Thank you, thank you. Yes, so our culture already has a system that's fairly decent, I would say, that um, at encouraging grief. So I would say, um, you know, it's my understanding that grief and pleasure exist on a spectrum, like a circular spectrum. And if there's a way in which I am not willing to feel grief about something, some painful situation in my life, I will also not have as much access to my pleasure. I would say that our current sort of therapeutic um, cultural ethos, self-help ethos is fairly good about um, encouraging, welcoming, making space for grief. I mean, we could always use more help with that, but it's fairly well understood that if you've experienced hard things, you will probably need to grieve to move that through. So I don't, um, so I do honor that, but I don't place particular emphasis on it because I think a lot of other people are handling that and holding space for that very well. Um, I am interested in the sort of the other side of the spectrum, which I don't think has been much supported at all, which is that it is possible for humans to delight in absolutely everything in our experience after we have grieved it well enough. Usually, you know, many of us, at least I'll speak for me, I was in therapy for 10 years for painful things that I experienced in my childhood and um 
just the general challenge of life. And I got to a place where I was kind of like all grieved out. <laughs> but my life, uh, and my life had gotten better through the process of therapy, but it wasn't, um, you know, I knew that there were levels that I wanted to get to that grieving would not take me to. And so I started to get curious about, um, about feeling pleasure and about celebrating and about accessing the part of me that is non-dual and immortal and uh, that knows how to rejoice in absolutely every dimension of life, including polarities like scarcity, rejection, loss, uh, failure, um, all these sorts of things that, especially in our modern Western society, we're taught, you know, uh, are to be avoided at all costs and there's absolutely nothing good about them. And if you experience them, that just means that you suck and you should go away and, <laughs> you know, all of these things. So um, there's also something I think that's intrinsically worthwhile um, about putting a focus on pleasure. And there's been a lot of, in maybe the past uh, decade or the past two decades, I've seen things with like Mama Gina's work, you know, there's that book Pussy by Mama Gina. And um, there was the, uh, the Nicole de Don sort of one taste movement that was privileging uh, pleasure. And certainly what I see that as is a attempt to bring back eros into focus. You know, for thousands of years, Western culture has been like, all logos all the time, logos, 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 <laughs> nothing matters but logos. And we've all suffered from that, right? We've all um, felt deep disconnection and a deep imbalance. And of course, Jung heavily associated Eros with the feminine principle of relatedness and connectedness. And um, the feminine has been shamed and repressed and injured in many, many ways. So. I regard existential kink as sort of eros oriented, perhaps we could even say like feminine principle oriented approach towards, uh, frankly, enlightenment, you know, as opposed to like meditating to still the mind, what we're doing is we are meditating to um, open up and release energies in the body, bliss energies. Um, and we are we're also working with logos because existential kink has a lot to do with to access the eros in our bodies we need to um, create some loosening and some opening around the logos around the story the meaning that we're creating out of our experience so what i really love about my existential kink practice um, for example i could tell a little story about it um, the first time i was able to get off on something I had been, um, you know, so for seven years, I was a PhD student and I made about $1,500 a month. And then I finished my PhD and um, I was working as a freelance resume writer for illiterate Coca-Cola executives. And I was scraping by and making about $1,000, $1,500 a month, just working my little fingers to the bone um, on this rather sad line of work. and. I was, um, you know, paying student loans and I was um, paying friends a few hundred dollars a month to sleep on their couch. And I was in a bad state. I was pretty messed up. And there, of course, there were people that I knew from college and high school who um, were already had their own homes and were starting families, right? And here I was pretty destitute. I was standing in line at the food bank in order to be able to eat because I couldn't afford groceries. And it seemed like things were rather grim. And of course, there's a very, uh, a, a joke that really tickles me now that was very, very unfunny to me in those days, which was, um, what can you do with an English degree? Anything you can do without one. <laughs> so I had this very fancy English degree, critical and cultural studies, and uh, completely useless, essentially, for making money. Um, Anyways, I had read all of the psychology, all of the continental philosophy, and I had also read a ton of like law of attraction stuff and metaphysical stuff. And I really got curious one day as I was standing in line at the food bank, I was like, gee whiz, you know, the law of attraction says that we create what we desire and Freud and Jung talk about how it's possible to have desires buried in the unconscious. 
I wonder if there is some unconscious part of me that really desires, really loves this whole thing where I am broke all the time and I'm in this big struggle and I'm perpetually embarrassed. I just, I just started getting curious about it and I paid attention to myself and um, I started doing the work of Byron Katie around it, which maybe many of you are familiar with. I think that's a great um, warm up exercise for existential kink because it's so good at loosening the mind and bringing opposites, you know, to meet each other. And I started really questioning around it. And I was working as a coach at the, at, at the time. And I think I was um, <laughs> bringing in like $400 a month as a coach too, in addition to the resume writing. And I knew these other friends of mine who were coaches who made like $1,000 per session as a client or with clients. And that just blew my mind. That was so far outside of anything that I was familiar with. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents worked in a nonprofit, like making $25 an hour was good money. <laughs> so when I was hearing about these coaches that I knew making $1,000 an hour, I was like, what? How is that possible? And so I was doing this Byron Katie questioning about it. And I was doing questioning on the belief people should want to pay me lots of money for my coaching. And I got to the turnaround. Um, so in Byron Katie, you, you take the initial statement, you question it with, um, is it true? Can I absolutely know that it's true? How do I react when I believe that thought? Who would I be without that thought? And you go inside and you contemplate that. And then you get you take the original statement and you turn it around a few different ways to its opposite, to self, to other. So I turned the statement around to people should absolutely never want to pay me money for coaching ever at all. And I read that out loud to myself and I felt this zing in my body. Like my whole body was like, yes, yes. <laughs> Nobody should ever want to pay me. <laughs> And then I was like, what is that about? What is that about? And, um, you know, it was like an undeniable, like somatic agreement with this uh, scarcity belief. And so I got really curious and it just occurred to me that, you know, as many of us are aware, there's sophisticated people in communities around the world and BDSM communities and they, um, you know, they have scenes where they set up safe words and intentions and they act out different roles and they might use, um, they might do play with power dynamics or they might um, use uh, whips and all sorts of sensation things. And, and that's what gets called kink. And uh, I had had a teeny bit of, teeny tiny bit of experience with that, not a whole lot, but enough to know that it existed. And I was just thinking to myself, like, oh, my goodness, I don't just have like a bedroom kink or a dungeon kink that I could do on weekends. I have this existential kink that affects my income, <laughs> that affects like, no wonder I don't make any money because I'm so turned on by the thought of nobody ever wanting to pay me. And it just became very, very clear to me that that was an actual thing going on in my body. And um I said to myself, well, you know, at least what I could do is I could make room for myself to feel this pleasure, to allow this pleasure to be fully felt and fully received. Because, you know, maybe that will do nothing to change the situation, but hell, at least I can enjoy myself instead of just feeling miserable all the time. So I started doing that. And actually within a few weeks, um, I was able to let myself feel it so strongly that it moved through me as an actual orgasm. And then a week or two after that, I started having um, inspirations and ideas for business, business stuff like I had never had before. And it wasn't, you know, mind shattering, but it was just stuff that I never thought that before that I could do because I didn't identify myself as a creative, fulfilled person. I identified myself as a lacking, kind of pathetic, trapped, limited person. But suddenly I understood that rather than being limited by my brokenness, I was actually deeply erotically fulfilled by it. And I started to experience myself as a fulfilled person. 
And it turns out when you deeply somatically feel yourself to be fulfilled, that really opens the doors of creativity. So pretty soon I had some business ideas and I started acting on them, just, you know, things with marketing, my coaching and my teaching. And a few months later, I was making $10,000 a month as opposed to $1,500 a month. And I was like, hot damn, I'm moving to Bali. So I left Pittsburgh and I moved to Bali for a while. And um, that was sort of the beginnings of existential kink for me. And then, um, of course, I began sharing it with my clients and the people in my classes. And I, we quickly found that it could be applied to all sorts of things and that people could have all sorts of amazing and really truly astoundingly rapid transformations with things. And basically all it took was being willing to be open to this idea that we might take be taking unconscious pleasure in unpleasant things and um, being willing to set aside any guilt or shame associated with that. And one way that helps I find to set aside that guilt and shame is to really think about this is actually a super universal human thing that Freud and Jung and Adler and um, Jacques Lacan were all very well aware of and was foundational to the whole flourishing origin of um, psychology and psychotherapy in the modern era. But it's, I guess up till now, it just hadn't been picked up by pop psychology or whatever, because it's, of course it's extremely offensive to everybody's ego you know, whatever we're suffering with, like dating awful people who disappoint us or this lack of money or whatever, to be told like, you know, there's, there's probably some part of you that really, really likes that. <laughs> you know, that's the rudest thing ever. Nobody wants to hear that. That is, that's, you know, that's terrible, right? And of course, Freud and Jung also found it very, very hard to directly tell people that. And it was interesting. I've been reading a lot of their biographies lately. And what I can tell is that a lot of um, the dream interpretation work came about because they found that the easiest way to get somebody to accept that they really, really liked some forbidden, ostensibly awful thing in their life was to show them that their own dreams told them that they liked it. And that that was the easiest way to get them to deeply accept it because if you just straight up told them they'd be like fuck you I'm out of here and I'm not paying you bye <laughs> right <laughs> so um existential kink is sort of like a radical little shortcut here where I'm just saying like hey if we're willing to um radically open our minds and to super super humble ourselves and to be open to the possibility that there is more going on in our psyches than our conscious minds generally like or agree to um we can just do this you know shadow integration in a matter of weeks or months instead of decades and we can really really move on with our lives so um and i'm well I'm, i've been talking for a long time so i'm just gonna zip it and pass the ball back to you laura thanks so I was listening to some of your podcasts um, and prep for this, and there is a line that you said in one of them that penetrated my mind, my soma in this way mm -hmm. that I think it'll be working through me for a while. And I also think it's sort of perhaps the, uh, the deeper structure or the bigger picture of your work, it, it can frame that in a way. So I think it was around a Sawen episode and um, what you said was I'm re something along the lines, I'm remembering that my biological survival is not the most important thing. And so I just wanna invite you to speak to that a little bit more because um, it's so, this is the piece of your work that's so counter the cult the, the dominant narrative of the culture mm, mm -hmm. oh thank you so much yes absolutely so yeah so we live in um a culture that is saturated with secular materialism right so we have these sort of kind of um impotent versions of christianity lingering around just to speak of the modern us which i'm most familiar with and then we have secular materialism and basically secular materialism has taken everything over. Um, and the idea 
in materialism, right, is uh, when you die, there is nothing. You you are just over. There's just a great blackness, basically. Um, there's, you know, your life meant nothing. Uh, soon everybody will forget you. Um, so the only thing that matters is your um, biological life. And death is like, mm, you know, it's to be avoided at all costs. Like that's what our medical system is all about is um, keeping somebody alive, even if they're, you know, in a vegetal state, they must be kept alive. Um, and this idea that death is, um, you know, uh, the death is just this termination, this void, uh, really, really helps serve the, the powers that be very well because it helps keep everybody very, very afraid. Something that I think about is the cultures that were most resistant to being enslaved um, were cultures that had the strongest beliefs in the immortality of the soul. And um, so for example, it was very, very hard to enslave a bunch of Vikings because they were completely convinced that if they died in battle, they were going to Valhalla <laughs> and they were really, really happy about that. And they had no problem with you killing them. Um, so anyways, it's very, very easy to enslave modern Americans because we are all completely terrified of death or bodily injury. And we regard it as the worst thing that could ever conceivably happen to us. So, um, you know, and of course uh, the pandemic um, is a interesting meditation on that. I don't wanna diminish the reality of the, um, the threat of the virus or insult anybody's wise and compassionate precautions that they're taking around it. But I do certainly think that there is a hysterical note in the media surrounding it that is very, very, very much like um, about the fear of death and death as being the worst thing that could happen to somebody. Whereas, you know, actually, right, like our, our forefathers, our philosophical uh, forefathers and mothers would be like, mm, no, <laughs> the worst thing that can happen to you is being ignorant and enslaved, right? <laughs> so uh, one thing that is, you know, interesting with existential kink, so people will come up with things like, um, or here, I, I will tell you a story from my own life. Uh, I was once in a violently abusive relationship um, with a guy who was super jealous super controlling and that that relationship was not good for my biological well-being obviously right like what is a primary way that women die it's at you know via partner violence so um this was uh so how do i say um i knew that i needed to find a way to get off on my attraction to being controlled by this guy because I couldn't seem to end the relationship. I would break up with him and then I would like call him the next day because there was an addictive component for it, for me. I was like hooked in. And um, so there's no way to get off on it if I'm completely preoccupied just with the safety of my body because it's it's too horrible, right? Like I can't let myself take pleasure in danger because that's dangerous. <laughs> and, um, and yet I found myself in this position. And of course, for anybody out there who's listening to this, if, if you have the ability to remove yourself from a unsafe situation and you know how to do that, absolutely, please do that. And I, I heartily encourage you to. I did not have the the psychic resources to remove myself. So um, I practiced uh, existential kink on it and I practiced letting myself feel the taboo, forbidden, previously unconscious pleasure that I felt in, um, in his control in this level of desire where he was treating me like an object. In fact, he was treating me like a drug, like I was like heroin and he had a right to control his supply to his heroin and he's treating me in this way. 
And um, I was able to let myself get off on it. And, and once I did, I felt free of the situation and I was able to leave and go on with my life. But part of what was, um, what helped me get off on it was remembering that um, my soul is immortal and my soul, so how do I say this? Um, there's a way in which, uh, okay, I can feel myself about to go into a big, rather abstract metaphysical spiel. And if, if you would all rather be spared that, I can do it. Um, or I could let rip. What wouldst thou prefer? Uh, let rip? Okay. So um, obviously what I'm about to say is unprovable. This is stuff that has come to me in vision and, and that I feel is supported by our philosophical and esoteric traditions. Um, but I, I feel that my soul uh, decided to incarnate because it wanted to experience duality, right? So like when, if I'm just like floating in the celestial cosmic soup and I'm at one with everything and I'm at one with divinity and I'm omniscient and omnipotent and everything's groovy, it's a little bit boring, little bit boring. Um, and I just feel like there's the reason why we're here and why I'm here is because somebody said, somebody was like, hey, look, there's this place you can go. It's called earth. It's full of duality. There's night and there's day. There's good and there's evil. There's hate and there's love. You can go down there. It is scary AF. Um, it's also like a kind of beauty that you can't experience in any other way. You can only get it there because it's in contrast with all this super scary stuff. Um, plus when you incarnate, you totally forget all of this stuff about who we are now. You just forget it and you got to remember it again. That's part of the game. You got to remember it while you're on this nutty roller coaster <laughs> of beauty and pain and night and day. And uh, so I said yes to incarnate. And what I find is when I give myself permission to get off on something, what that helps me do is it helps me reclaim in an embodied way um, more of the memory of who I truly am, my larger self, my self with a capital S as Jung would have it, um, you know, my immortal soul as Plato would have it. Um, that's that's just says yes to all of it to the whole ride to the crazy controlling boyfriend relationship to the flowers and the babies and the giggles to the war and the tragedy and the you know just yes sign me up i am going on this ride i am so down for all of it i'm not into shaming or dissing any of it i just want to feel all of it and when I let myself inhabit that state of openness, um, it really, I find with some practice, it really is possible to uh, inhabit the place where I'm letting myself feel what I like to call reality's orgasm, right? So um, we know for a fact from physics uh, that kind of what's happening all the time is there's electrons and there's protons doing naughty little dances all over the place and there's just this um, sort of ongoing interpenetration of um, of dark matter and regular matter and uh, and this dance of electricity and magnetism fire and water um, all very 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 sexy and it is perpetually happening. And of course, if we look around at um, various traditions, you know, we can see tantric Buddhism. There's always, you know, Buddhas and their consorts. Likewise, in a lot of um, gorgeous Indian tantric art, and then likewise in alchemical Hermetic art, we see the, you know, the Sun King and the Moon Queen always um, getting it on. And I just realized that is what's always happening. That is, and that is a very powerful level of reality to, 
you know, kiss and, and, and to touch and to let into my body every once in a while. And it's a level of reality that, um, again, by our popular culture is completely denied, right? Basically, the message that we get from the news is that everything sucks all the time. Everything will continue to suck. Um, people are just being shitty to one another all over the world perpetually, and that's what's going on. <laughs> and yeah, that's happening. And at another level, it's this, uh, it's this cosmic orgasm is happening. Um, so... Okay, I think I've lost my thread. I go back, pass it to you, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, when I, just to bring it back around so that, you know, I pointed to this thing you said um, that your biolo biological survival is not the most important thing. And just my interpretation of what you just shared is the interest in soul making on this journey. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I do, I so love that phrase from Keats, you know, this world is not a veil of tears, it's a veil of soul making. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so beautiful? Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely 1000% agree that what we are here to do is to realize ourselves completely. So um, I like to think um, about well, certainly um, mandalas from all over the world and Jung's mandalas. And just that the self with a capital S, it's a wholeness, right? It's a circle. And um, it just includes absolutely everything. So that gives me a lot of hope and a lot of strength because it lets me know that uh, sure, I definitely feel plenty identified most of the time with this body and this personality and you know I'm a lady from Pittsburgh and I like chocolate ice cream and all of that stuff uh, but in another sense right whatever is um, conscious in me whatever is um, moving through me is absolutely not limited in this way by this body or this personality is sort of just using this as a fun little vehicle and this little vehicle completely expendable utterly expendable, completely, you know, whatever. And um, it, that just cheers me up to think about nowadays. I don't know, it used to not, but it sure does now because, it, it, um, oh, and actually, could I, t let's see, anybody here like Alistair Crowley at all? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of some interest here. He's a controversial guy, for sure. Yes, wise and troubled. Um, so absolutely, he was a giant asshole in his lifetime. And, um, and I think, you know, like, you know, a, a lot of geniuses are giant assholes. I guess that's what I have to say about that. I think he was a genius in addition to being a giant asshole. And, uh, and um, he, um, so as I've gone deep in the hermetic tradition, which again, I feel really supports existential kink um, because it's all about the unification of polarities, right? And in existential kink, what we work with primarily is the polarity of pain and pleasure. And, oh boy, so much to say. Um, actually, would you, Maybe I'll talk a little bit about hermetic polarities for a minute before I talk about weird Uncle Al. Is that cool? So um, if we look at the work of Jung, he talked about uh, four functions of the psyche, right? Uh, sensing, feeling, thinking, and intuiting. And I think that those can be very nicely mapped onto the four traditional hermetic elements, right? So sensing is earth, uh, feeling is water, um, thinking is air, and intuiting is fire. And I think that there are um, four fundamental polarities of earthly, of human embodied existence that also map on to those traditional elements and to those Jungian functions. So uh, for sensing, I would say it's pain and pleasure. 
for feeling, I would say it's actually uh, good and evil, right? Because we're happy when we feel like things are good for us and we're sad when, they, when we feel like things are evil for us. Um, for thinking, I would say it's a good old thesis and antithesis. And for intuiting, I'm not completely sure, but something like uh, self and other, or even maybe feminine and masculine. What existential kink does, and I think part of why it works so quickly to dramatically transform people's material experience, like my, you know, my material experience of wealth was dramatically transformed by it. My material experience of um, having lovers was dramatically and rapidly transformed by it. So I, I went from having a really controlling, abusive, sucky boyfriend. Now my husband today is just, he is a wonderful, amazing man. His name is Taya. Um, and, and, and I'm not alone in this. Other people have gotten very concrete results. I think part of why that happens is because it is the earth. Um, it's associated with the earth polarity of pain and pleasure and our physical concrete experience, which of course, uh, astrologically, I'm a Capricorn. I'm always interested in bringing things to that earthly level. I, I just love the practical level of it. But there's also ways that we can work with um, resolving and finding balance in our lives and creating miracles through the other polarities, uh, you know, the good and evil with feeling, the thesis and antithesis with thought. The Byron Katie work is amazing for working with the thesis and, and the antithesis, right, for example. Um, uh, there's Buddhist practices like Tong Len that are amazing for working with the distinction between self and other. Um, so those were just those were just some thoughts there about hermeticism and polarities and existential kink. To do with them what you will, but they they occurred to me while I was thinking about Alistair. So good old Uncle Alistair. Um, he had a, a channel, a channeling experience, an epiphany in 1904. He had um, been doing the headless rite, which is, is anybody familiar with the Greek magical papyri? Um, I'm really into the Greek magical papyri. They were this uh, set of manuscripts that was discovered um, and only translated in fairly recent times. Anyways, Alistair was doing a famous invocation from them called the Headless Rite uh, in the chamber of the Great Pyramid at Giza, which I guess you could get into those days in 1904 if you gave enough money to the right tour guide. And uh, he did this invocation and he had this channeling experience and he wrote this thing called the Book of the Law that then became a foundational document for the rest of his life and philosophy. Uh, But what, he, what the Book of the Law talks about and what lots of other channelers and people have talked about is the coming of a new aeon, the coming of a new age, right? Like this idea of like the age of Aquarius and the age of um, just like the whole, everybody, anybody remember the big hoopla around 2012? Wasn't that fun? That was so fun. This year, mm, kind of less fun, but still fascinating in, in the scope of the changes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what got me on this hobby horse, but the point being is I do believe that we, oh, oh, I remember, I remember now. The way that Alistair talked about the new age, the new aeon coming, was he talked about it as, um, you know, for the past 3,000 years, we've been in a patriarchal age, which uh, called the aeon of, of Osiris. And before that, we had a kind of matriarchal age. And in the matriarchal age, visions and magic and the unconscious were very treasured and very important, sort of like what we see in some um, indigenous groups still today, like in the Amazon, people working with ayahuasca and these deep mother visionary energies. And he called that the Aeon of Isis. And then we had the Aeon of Osiris where the conscious mind was privileged and science and um, you know reason and technology and battle and all of these masculine traits were really, really valorized. And uh, Uncle Alistair talked about this new age that according to him started in 1904, but I think it's really starting to kick off now, was the age of Horus, the age of the child. So the union of the mother and the father 
the union of the unconscious and the conscious minds in humans, creating a new kind of consciousness, a new hermaphroditic or androgynous consciousness, also reflected in um, you know, the beautiful flowering of um, people becoming aware of non-binary and, and transgender identities and having those be more celebrated. Um, and even um, I, I think a great cultural figure who kicked off the larger awareness about gender fluidity was David Bowie, right? And David Bowie was uh, himself really, really into this particular flavor of magic and the teachings of Crowley and everything like that, which I find interesting. Um, but what I'm saying is I am actually filled with this beautiful, sweet optimism these days, because as messed up as everything is, and lordy, 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 it's pretty messed up, right? All the stuff with the environment, all the stuff with the weird authoritarian government and uh, war and addiction and all the problems that we humans have. I've started to think that um, there's actually something that this, that the new age that has been prophesized, the new aeon that has been prophesized by a number of folks, I can actually see the route, the a path towards it now, whereas previously I at least could not see it. And that path forward to me seems to be, um, again, the alchemical marriage, the union of the conscious and the unconscious minds, which I now know that individual humans are able to do rather rapidly you know it used to be thought for millennia that you could only do this alchemical work over you know you need at least five decades to get anywhere with it and it's now I've, I've seen it with my own eyes I like to call myself an evangelical hermeticist um, because you know I've seen the good word in action like uh, brother, have you heard that the uh, as above, <laughs> the below is as the above <laughs> to fulfill the miracle of the one thing? It's all really happening, and, and we can use this knowledge to actually transform our lives. Um, so, okay. So, anyways, I guess I just want to put that out there that mm -hmm. um, there's lots of reasons to look around from a materialist, uh, secular materialist point of view and be extremely depressed. And I think there's lots of reasons to look around from a depth psychology hermetical point of view and be extremely optimistic and extremely happy because I do think that this integration is um, is actually able to happen and that people are doing it. You know, fine folks like yourselves are willing to listen to a weirdo like me right now. And a lot of other people are doing this work and similar other kinds of wonderful work. And I actually, there's a lot of deep hope in my heart that we will all be able to um, work with our shadows and integrate them and, and pull things together and get to a much more interesting and beautiful level of consciousness and experience of life than the one that we have been creating up to now. So I'm just peachy excited about that. Great. So just presencing the time, um, we have 10 minutes till the top of the hour and I've hogged your time so far. So I wanna get some others questions in and ideally to, to answer maybe two or three questions if, if we can, that would be ideal. So um, Colty, would you like to unmute and ask your first question? let um oh yeah i'm yes if there's another question i'm still coming down from like having okay. my mind and consciousness i'm experiencing yeah. existential kink right now come yeah. back to me and i will ask my first question <laughs> okay great then um let's have i think it was mark would you like to ask your question i asked two and I'm sort of came back to them now I'm just trying to focus in on what it was I think the second one speaks to me more probably no, the, the first one was about um finding the real juice in the things we deny or the the, 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 the patterns that keep coming up the failures and this sort of thing and what comes up for me is that when I've looked at these generally I they've come up with 
oh, I do these things to stay safe. And it's in fact, for example, the success or the bigger me that I'm more scared of. And as I speak it, it's all oh, my goodness, it gives me the willies. You know, and it's there where potentially the real, so that's the opposite. And I'm not sure, I'm sure I need to look into what you some what you said about those other bits. There may be another dimension, but it was that's what came to mind. And I wanted your, your reflections. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. So in the Existential Kink book, there's actually a section um, um, called it's on I forget what, yeah, it's called Havingness Meditation. So this is totally a thing. So um, I like to talk about, you know, a havingness level. So we all have different havingness levels for different stuff, right? Some of us are able to make tons of money every month, but maybe our havingness level for friends and parties is really, really tiny and we feel very lonely. Or we have a giant havingness level for lovers and friends and community and we feel great, but our, you know, our havingness level for money or for our creative expression is very, very small. So, um, this sort of flip side of what you're talking about of um, kind of like a kinky avoidance of, of the good stuff, right? Of like, because we recognize that anything, um, in especially good stuff, can be very, very sensational too. So for example, um, you know, if, if we got off this call and I heard a knock on the door and I answered the door and it was Mr. Elon Musk and his retinue. And he was like, Dr. Elliot, I have heard of you and um, I really want to hire you. I really, really want to pay you. Um, I think a million dollars a minute would be good to coach me, <laughs> right? That would, that would be extremely sensational. I would be like, whoa, whoa what's happening here? And um, it's very common for us humans, again, because we have this little kind of homeostasis that we, of sensation that we are used to um, living in. If something, something bad happens outside of that level, we don't like it. And also if something good happens outside of that level, we don't like it. And we will unconsciously, um, you know, make sure that that stuff doesn't happen, push away opportunities or, you know, freak out or find something to object to in something and whatever. So there is um, a kind of sister meditation to existential kink meditation called havingness meditation, where what we do is we practice um, imagining different, more positive scenarios. So um, like uh, one that I'm working on is, you know, imagining existential kink getting on to some bestseller lists and being really, really honest with myself about what would that actually feel like in my body and feeling, you know, it's like this live wire kind of thing that's almost like too hot to hold and just like practicing, like, can I keep breathing with that? Can I keep opening to that? Can I keep learning how to be present with it? And I know that when I learn how to be present with it in a way that I feel confident that I can receive that much sensation and still be centered without going into, um, there's a few different classic responses of unconscious reactivity, you know, like uh, getting really angry, getting really scared, shutting down, numbing out, getting into drugs, getting, right, so many famous people get into drugs, all sorts of things. When I feel confident that I can receive that sensation and stay centered, I know it'll happen. <laughs> and until then, it probably won't happen because I'll probably find ways to make sure it doesn't happen somehow, <laughs> either on a, a very tangible level or just an energetic level. So yes, does that help answer your question, Mark? It does actually. And what comes to mind there is in parallel sort of trauma work of my window of tolerance. So if I, as you say, if I go above it or below it, I, I restrict what I allow myself to feel. Uh, and that really ties in with that. But and yeah, so I'm gonna, Really great, thank you. I shall go away and uh, meditate on that and look into it and play with it. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. So uh, I just wanna check in with Carolyn. Um, it's four minutes to the top of the hour. Could we sneak in one more question or do you need to, do um, we need I, to wrap up? Go, thank you so much. I could go like 10 more minutes of conversation. Perfect, great. Colty, take it away. I'm 
much more grounded than when you first called on me. Um, I'm experiencing so much excitement that you're here. Um, I've been working very closely with the synchronicities of how you, Dr. Carolyn Elliott, have been showing up in my life everywhere lately. So it's very exciting to, to be here with you. And that informs my question. Um, I'm curious, how do you or are you uh, getting off on the scarier parts of having more attention and success and visibility? Like, how do you relate to parasocial relationships as your businesses grow, your words influence others, your magic gets out there in the world? Like, I'm in your program influence right now. You've been buzzing around in my world. But I also recognize we've never met. So I'm super curious how you relate to that uh, as things grow. Oh, thank you. Colty, what a marvelous question and, and what a pleasure to make your virtual acquaintance. Um, wow. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a fascinating ongoing thing. Um, uh, hmm. I think um, mostly it's just joyful. It's just really, really sweet and joyful to be able to have these interactions. Um, I have gotten over time um, a lot I have a lot more boundaries. So oftentimes, like when I first started out doing my work on the internet, right? Like I, I taught influence. I spent three hours a day answering all of the questions in the group. I, when I did live events, I would show up and have dinner with everybody. And then everybody would, you know, we would all hug for like an hour afterwards. And that was great. And I am actually an introvert. <laughs> like I am actually, you know, and so, uh, I would get really, really drained. And of course, then I would get resentful. And then of course, I would not want to do as much to spread the word. And so anyways, I found over time, as part of working with my sensation window and my having this level, that I do need to have uh, containers of interaction. And I do need to have, and I'm blessed to have a lot more help with, um, you know, making everything happen. So for example, um, Last year, I did my first existential kink coach training program with a dear friend of mine named Dave Burns, and we had um, 18 women go through the program, and we were open to men, too. We just happened to just have women apply, uh, and we taught that pretty much all of all ourselves, and now this year, we're going to, in, in spring of 2021, we're going to open it up again, and we're going to have uh, people come in, but now the ladies that I trained to be the coaches are going to do the bulk of the teaching and I'm going to do more like guest appearance teaching. So anyways, there's just, um, it's been really fascinating. Um, you know, in the Western tradition, there's something called becoming a magus. And when you become a magus, the idea is you've uttered a word and your word has gone into the world and it has become larger than you. Yeah, some of you are familiar with this. So, um, uh, so, you know, uh, obviously like with Freud, the word was psychoanalysis and he uttered that and it went into the world and then other people ran with it. And I, I guess it's, um, I'm very blessed and honored to have my word be existential kink. And now, you know, it is bigger than me and, um, and I'm very excited to have other people teaching it and other people with, um, you know, the coaches that I've trained and everybody who has their own elaborations and their own perspectives that are extremely deep to give. Um, uh, so yeah, mostly mostly super joyous and just I've, I'm learning actually, like I have this ambition to become um, a really big time hermit in five years. Like I really wanna be, um, I don't know what, like go to a house in the country and like just chillax. So I'm trying to make myself um, highly, highly dispensable, highly replaceable is um, my ambition. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, but again, like, I, I guess just one more thing is just like this optimism that's been pouring into me lately just is maybe the heart of it. I can just feel people, people that are being touched and are getting this modality seem to be like changing things so fast for themselves and for those around them that it just fills me with delight and I am honored always to meet and talk with them and they're I'll zip. 
Thanks so much. So um, it's time to close and I'll just ask if you have any closing words for us. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, so I just opened up the chat and I saw fun things that you guys were talking about. Um, <laughs> closing words. Well, just, um, I, I thank you also so much for coming and being willing to listen and for participating in this beautiful larger project here that's being organized highly, highly worthwhile. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, if anybody is further interested in my work, I'll just give you a little rundown of the ways to stay in touch with me. Um, I have an Instagram, I'm uh, at Carolyn Elliott underscore, Alchemy of the Psyche is the title of the page. And find me on there, follow me on there. Um, I have a website, carolyngraceelliot.com. Uh, you can, there's forms to join my email list on that website. Um, I send out fun emails pretty regularly. People tell me they're awesome. Um, I think I'm starting an existential kink podcast pretty soon. So for that podcast, I will be um, sharing stories from my own experience and I'll be interviewing my trained coaches and people who have been through my programs and we should have some fun, inspiring tales there. So if you join the email list and follow me on Instagram, you will find out when the podcast comes out. And um, my program Thrill, which is a program um, about how to build an online um, audience and business and persona by integrating taboo, previously forbidden, unconscious parts of yourself, I think is currently, yeah, is currently open for registration. And the link to that can be found currently in, in my Instagram bio and is also being sent out on my email list. So the Thrill program is open right now. In March, we will be having um, an open registration period for the Wealth Membership. And the Wealth Membership is pretty intense. Um, it's $99 a month and there's very, very many things included with it, including multiple mentoring sessions a month with myself and other genius guest teachers on hermetic practices, on business, online business practices, um, on things having to do with writing and content creation. We work with um, the Thoth Tarot, which is you know connected to Alistair Crowley, and and we work with astrological matters. And it's it's kind of hard to summarize. I sort of wish that I had created a slightly simpler membership program, but it's awesome. And we also have social events where we play games like um, communication games that are designed to help us learn how to be present in high sensation. So that's they're really really fun and sexy and delightful. And we also have online gift circles. So I know that you guys are into gift economy here, at least like Peter is, and we're into gift economy too. So we have online gift circles where people exchange amazing things. And uh, yeah, that's really awesome. That opens in March. I do do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. The information about that is available on my website. There's a, a little waiting list. Um, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, the um, the existential kink coach training program is um, our application process for that will probably open again in May, and that I believe the price point for that it's going to be like a fifteen thousand dollar investment, and there's a payment plan, and we are doing live in person immersion. So we're having people do COVID tests beforehand, and then we're getting together in person and it's going to be in Miami and it's going to be so exquisitely fun. So that's all happening too. And, uh, and we do uh, gentlemen and people of all genders are very, very welcome. Just <laughs> uh, although we have had ladies in the past. Okay, I think that's a whole lot that I've told you about. And thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're all feeling the alchemical transmission according to the chat. <laughs> so um, I'm going to, speaking of arrows, um, my favorite topic, I'm going to tag in Jot um, just to talk about some events that are coming up that Jot and Peter and I are collaborating on. Is Jot, Jot here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I am ready. <laughs> I'm in a very highly aroused state. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, the energy here is great. And the events that are coming up are really inspired by the, the turn on that I feel at the STOA. The first, like when I first got on here, um, in one of the first sessions, Peter chatted into the chat idea sex. And 
I being a sapiosexual, I'm just I was like, yes, <laughs> like a community of people online I can have idea sex with during the pandemic. Like, whoa, okay, great. Um, and so my friend and I, after all the sessions we were living together, we would have idea sex. And it was it was really challenging at times, actually. It was really difficult and um, rewarding. So Peter and I, and also Lara, Lara and I have a project called our Anatomy Project. And we've really been wondering what we can bring to the STOA. Um, the project is a social experiment inspired, inspired by cultural, cultural somatics. Um, and we're studying how to better teach and learn about human sexuality. And we're doing that through art and um, making beautiful imagery that is affirming. And we just want to experiment, essentially. So it's, it's emergent. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Woo! <laughs> All right. So I may need a little help getting the logistical aspects of this proposal together. Um, so we're going to we're going to experiment with having idea sex basically how can we have it better how can we be more pleasurable what can we discover about ourselves um and it's going to be in february we're going to have three sessions one is going to be about feeling our heart and then letting that energy drip drop down and hear from what is coming up from below um that's going to be called um collective arrows collective arrows yeah and um, the other one is idea sex, and it's going to be kind of a workout to help us get primed for collective eros even even more and better once we understand what that is. So we'll first we'll be experiencing collective eros, and then idea sex, and then we'll have collective eros idea sex party at, on Valentine's Day. So thank heavens we'll be having a sexy Valentine's Day, um, and you're invited to come. We invite you all to come. All right, everyone. Uh, I guess I'll officially close out. Uh, Carolyn, thank you so much. Uh, Laura, thank you so much. Uh, and um, yeah, enjoy. Happy Inauguration Day. <laughs>